Okay, um, so first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for the invitation um, to this conference. Uh, my roots, as we just heard, are Polish, but unfortunately they are sufficiently distant that um, I don't speak a single word of Polish, um, except for hopefully knowing how to pronounce my last name. Um, good thing is when I arrived here first time in a long time, I was um, able to just use my name to check in and do things, and people didn't ask um, how to spell that name. Um, so that was good. Um, so I need to correct a little bit about the introduction, mostly around um, Azure. Um, I'm not running the entire um, Azure organization um, at Microsoft. That is a total of several thousand people working on Azure. Um, I have been, until a few months ago, running a new kind of startup, if you like, service within Azure called Stream Analytics. And um, just about three, four months ago or so, I was asked to run um, our next larger big data analytics um, team that now includes stream analytics, includes a different service called Azure Data Lake Analytics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, some of these things today. Um, but just, just to clarify that I'm not, not running um, <laughs> all of Azure. Um, the, the thing I want to talk about today is if we try to build solutions based on cloud services, then we run into a very large number of kind of mutually contradictory, if you like, requirements and constraints. And so I want to talk about that a little bit and about where we have been taking these things over the past <coughs> few years. Um, I do not want to claim at all that I or Microsoft has all the answers. Um, there's basically every one of my slides could also be taken as, as a recipe for a research program. Um, there's, there's just an endless um, amount of um, areas um, that, that still would, would be well deserving of further research. Um, so before we get dive in, um, I want to quickly talk about um, services and um, they are kind of one way of, of stratifying the world of services so you get a clearer picture of what these services actually do. Um, the notion of a service in the cloud is very abstract and, and it's really just saying um, that you can answer one question. There's one thing, one question that you can answer um, affirmatively in the case of a service and that you cannot answer at all um, for any other um, software artifacts. And that is, who is going to pay the power bill? So if you write a C++ class, asking who is writing, who's paying the power bill for using that class is, is a nonsensical question. Um, and you'll find this is true for, for almost anything. Um, so one, one way of identifying a service surefire is saying, okay, so who's going to pay the power bill for running that service? Uh, and so the, that, that's a kind of like a, almost a flippant way of doing things. The other thing is that, um, I think this picture here may be better for that. Um, this goes back to a classification um, done by Gartner um, about 10 years ago. The idea here is that you can take any arbitrary um, software abstraction and lift it to become a service. Right? You can, for example, say, hey, I know how to virtualize hardware and to run VMs on top of hardware. You can say, okay, that virtualization layer could be made a service, which means you can now submit virtual machine images, definitions of virtual machines, to that virtualization service, and it will spin up a VM for you. Right? So you can, wherever you look, anything, software, you can turn into a service. And um, this notion of I run everything on premises, which really saying I'm running everything on my own hardware, I'm paying the power bill, so to speak, to I'm running everything in someone else's data center, if you like. That's on the far um, right end. Um, I'm saying I'm running everything as software as a service. So for example, um, if you go and use Workday or, or many other such um, services, you basically get the entire solution that you needed for your particular problem space, like in this case workforce management, um, in the cloud. Right? And there's, there are these layers in between that are often called infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Um, infrastructure as a service is really just saying what I'm lifting up to cloud service level 
is at a very kind of low level. Um, it's mostly worrying about traditional storage, computation, networking, and maybe virtualization. Um, but that's, that's about it. So infrastructure as a service is where many of the cloud um, solutions or cloud, I should say cloud services, have started. Um, that's where AWS, for example, the Amazon cloud services started um, with pure um, virtualization of infrastructure. Um, platform services add higher level things on top with the idea that if you want to build solutions rather than effectively doing the same thing you would do if you ran your own data center, you actually want to have building blocks that provide higher level functionality that you can put together. And much of what I'm talking about today is about that realm of platform services. The interesting thing about platform services is that they individually, by definition, don't solve your problem. Right? So you always have to compose multiple platform services to get a solution. That's, that's why this stuff is close to my heart. I've always been very interested in, in the problem of composing solutions from um, smaller pieces. That's what led to um, the component software book. Um, I think I wrote the first version of that in 97. Um, took me to the services world. Um, I'm much less interested in the infrastructure or the software as a service layer, very interested in the platform as a service um, because it's all about composition. Let's see, I'm trying to use this thing. Aha. So when you think about um, services, um, unlike when thinking about, let's say, an algorithm or um, a software component, you can actually ask quality questions. Right? That's another way of saying, is it a service? Can I ask quality questions? And there's a long list of those things, and I'll um, drill into all of them a little bit, um, in the, starting with the space of security and privacy, right? um, close to the heart of everybody in Europe, um, closer to the heart of everybody in Europe than in many other parts of the world. Um, is privacy in particular. Um, tenancy models, we'll talk about that, um, really saying um, do you share resources across customers or not. Performance predictability, um, if you run your own stack on your own hardware in a fully controlled way, you may um, assume certain things about how predictable the behavior of the system is. Can you preserve any of that when you're running in, in some arbitrary um, cloud environment? Um, the questions around scale, how large can the stuff be that I want to run, um, compared to how much am I willing to pay for what that cloud service will cost me. Um, the semantic space, very interesting, and we'll talk about that. Um, management, um, I'll mostly refer back to a keynote from last year um, in Francis. Um, and then finally, geographic, geopolitical, um, and, and reliability as, as further areas. And there, there's more such slices, but these are all um, directly relevant to my daily work, if you like. Um, so um, you can already see the space is totally over-constrained. Um, no one can be an expert in all of them. Um, none of them can be removed. There may be more, but none of these can be ignored. They are all relevant. You can't just go and say, I'm going to build um, a world of cloud services, ignoring some of these points. Um, that's not going to fly. So let's start. Um, when we look at security and privacy, there are some obvious things, like for example, I would like data at rest to be encrypted. Right? What that really means is if someone walked into, let's say, a Microsoft Azure data center illegally and stole a hard drive out of one of the server racks, would they now have usable customer data or would they have unusable, strongly encrypted stuff on that disk? Right, so encryption at, risk, uh, encryption at rest is all about that, right? saying my, my customer data um, cannot be jeopardized by, by, for example, physical theft of storage devices. The next question then is who can decrypt such encrypted data? Right? And I could go and say, easy, um, the cloud services that need to use that data um, have the keys and know how to decrypt, and I'm going to trust them. That, in many cases, is actually the, the state of the art today. Um, but many customers, especially in many domains like banking, um, insist on something stronger. They say, yeah, of course I'm going to trust the cloud while it's processing my data in that moment in time. 
um, but I'm not sure I can trust it over time. Stuff may happen. So um, a lot of customers are saying, I need to ultimately own the keys and manage the keys. Maybe keys are protected under a root key and I only hold the root key in my own hands. Um, but if I withdraw that key, the whole chain should collapse and the entire cloud should lose access to my data for good. Right. Um, so you can see, I've only talked about encryption here. If I stay at that speed, we'll get to slide two. Um, by the time I'm done with my a lot of time here. Um, so let's go a little faster, but you can actually see this just in the space of security and privacy. Um, there's a whole rainbow um, of requirements. And as you know, when people talk about research in that space, they pick one of these areas and um, go and then spend years researching it. An interesting area, for example, is this, this space of Oops, sorry, it's the space of attack and intrusion detection. But right? if you're running um, cloud services in data centers spread around the world, um, so for, for Azure, for example, we're now talking probably about, about 40, 50 data centers in 25 or something regions around the globe. Um, all these data centers are essentially under um, virtual attack. Right? And so you have, to, you have to almost assume that in some fringe of the system at any one point in time, someone has potentially even managed to attack successfully. And what you want to do is prevent the spread of, an, of a successful attack on, for example, one virtual machine um, across the larger system. So detecting intrusions is, um, is very important. And um, it's one of the areas where there's kind of like an infinite potential for research. Really. So let's look at um, the performance um, space. And I don't know why we have the mouse pointer here. Do you see that too? Yeah. To so really, if you think about performance, um, what we ultimately are facing is a big trade-off question. Um, it's a trade-off between um, what you're willing to pay in return for the guarantees you can get. Right. The most extreme case, and it's also clearly the most expensive case, is you go and book a full stack of hardware and software in one or more of um, a cloud provider's data centers, and you're saying, this is where my stuff runs. Right. It's also the most old-fashioned way. It's basically the old hosting business, where you literally knew which rack in someone's data center you could walk up to, and that was your stuff. So except for not running literally in your own data center, it was really your stuff. Um, so that's, that's where you get the strongest guarantees, but you also pay by far the most. Um, and you, you can go and look at the spectrum. You can say, okay, no, I'm not going to statically allocate everything. I'm going to allocate resources dynamically as needed, um, but I'm still going to sort of go and um, then when they're allocated, exclusively use the resources. And um, ultimately, you can go all the way down to the other end. That's, by the way, what most um, software as a service systems do. If you, for example, go and use Facebook, for example, um, clearly you as a Facebook um, user will have absolutely no um, specifically allocated resources in the Facebook system. Instead, you're constantly competing with all other Facebook users, and you're up to some level of, of um, regulation policies inside their system. Um, to make sure that your attempt of visiting um, your own pages in Facebook and someone else's attempts um, don't interfere too much. Um, and uh, if you use any of those services, you know that this works pretty well. Right? And it clearly means that you're not at the cheapest end, which allows some, a company like Facebook to actually give this to you for free and make money by advertising, but fundamentally reduce the cost per user down to a level where giving it away for free um, is a plausible business model. So this related to, to the notion of tenancy. Um, as a company, for example, using cloud services, you may want to go and split your own organization into multiple tenants, and those may be separate cost centers or regulatorily separated parts of your company, and you just go and say, okay, um, every user within a tenancy um, is allowed to sort of share resources, um, but across tenants, I don't want any sharing. Right? Concern isn't performance, but security, for example. 
And um, the, the interesting thing here is that most of the um, cloud services, platform services that are most easily used and composed tend to be multi-tenanted services, right? So you'll actually get a conflict between those services and maybe a requirement of your organization to say, I want my solutions to be entirely on the single tenanted side. Um, so it's, it's quite a, this, this particular thing that looks so harmless often becomes a, a deciding factor of what you can even do and what you cannot do. This one here is an interesting perspective. Um, you know, from we just heard about in the previous keynote, we heard about um, optimizing for energy, right? Um, optimizing for energy is actually not so different from optimizing for cost. Right? You could actually argue that energy consumption is a form of price to pay against some finite capacity, like the batteries you have. Um, so, if you look at the, the kind of models on the right hand side here, the the top model is, is really the, I pre-allocate resources entirely for my own use. Right? This is sometimes called the cluster form factor. So you say, I go to a cloud provider and I want an ocean of virtual machines, pre-allocated, those are now mine. Now you're going to pay for the big golden rectangle there. Right? You basically say, okay, when I create that cluster all the way to when I shut it down again, I'm going to pay for this entire rectangular box um, over time and number of resources allocated, um, whether I use it or not. And the little graphs in there are meant to um, kind of signify different workloads you run in the cloud. Right? You know, some of those workloads, like the one on the bottom there, may actually have pretty predictable performance or load characteristics. Others may be much more spiky, um, like some of the others you see here. A different way of paying for running your various workloads in the cloud is to pay on a per job submission or in general a per submission <coughs> basis. Um, that's the middle model. And typically what you do is you pay, in that case, still for a rectangular box, which is saying the maximum resources I need for this particular um, job that I want to run um, is the height of my box and the length of the job running is the length of my box. Um, as you can just see visually, I'm going to pay much less um, in that case than for the um, cluster form factor in the top model. Um, but you may find that the price um, that is set um, in this middle model is higher. Because it turns out that for the cloud provider, this is actually a more expensive model to provide for you. But in general, this will be um, a much more cost-effective uh, model for you as the customer. Um, and ultimately, the kind of ideal state would be to say, I pay exactly for what I use, right? So I submit my, I submit my job, and as the job needs more resources, it gets more resources. As it needs fewer resources, it releases those, and I'm paying exactly for um, what I use. Um, it turns out that no one can actually do that, um, because acquisition and release of resources itself is, is a time constraint um, and costly operation. So at best, you get an elastic service that puts, instead of having a big rectangular box around your job, um, puts kind of a staircase-like envelope around your work. Okay. So this is a very interesting um, consideration um, because it totally differentiates how various cloud services work from a billing point of view. Right? And normally you would think, hey, from a more academic point of view, why do I care about this? But just as I might care about battery consumption um, in a network, as we heard in the previous talk, you very well want to worry about um, cost optimization, right? Even if it is not your own problem to, to actually pay for these workloads. Another one that is um, very interesting in the services world, more interesting than in, in many other configurations, um, is to actually ask what is the semantic model not the specific semantics of a specific operation, but the general semantic model that I'm shooting for when I'm building my solutions. I could, for example, say, yeah, you know, like, I'm a mathematician, I just want deterministic results. Right? Like, I describe model everything as functions, and I want that with those mathematical models to be exact. Um, or I can be all the way at the other end and say, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just willing to wait for a maximum time period and whatever best result at that point when, my, when I'm running out of time happens to be computed, that's what I want back. Right. And there's a full spectrum of things in between. And um, 
turns out again, different um, cloud services will give you different semantic models. Um, and as long as you're using only one of those services, that's great. You can pick the one you want, maybe, and you know what you're going to get. Um, if you're composing systems, this becomes really problematic, right? Because it turns out different cloud services actually track to different semantic uh, models at that meta level of, of how the results are guaranteed. And uh, composing them will give you not even the, the least, because these things are not even completely comparable, it will give you some more or less chaotic behavior, right? So unless you know exactly what you're doing, um, things, things will be, be a little bit off. Um, management, last year, um, you, if you were here last year, you would have heard um, my good friend Wojtek talk about um, telemetry um, and the fairly enormous efforts that um, are taken to actually even understand what um, solutions running in the cloud actually do. And so it gives you an idea, we just talked about the dozens of data centers that just Azure has around the globe. Um, we're actually, if you just do the math, we are talking about a few million machines um, that are allocated around the world, physical machines. Right? Uh, many of those machines these days are pretty beefy, have maybe 40 cores, and um, on the order of, of um, a terabyte of RAM, for example. Right? So you're looking at these machines, and they're everywhere around the globe, and they all do something. Hopefully, otherwise, it's bad for the company that owns those machines if they're all sitting there idle. Um, they all interact, possibly under different guidances. They may be under attack at any one point in time, anywhere between denial of service attacks to actual intrusions. So you want to go and manage all this stuff, both from the side of the operator, that would be as Microsoft, for example, for Azure, and from your side as the customer. You want to manage what, what are your solutions doing, are they healthy, um, are they perhaps running into capacity issues, um, whatever. Right, so it's a, it's a big, big sort of area um, that needs to be addressed. And again, I'm going back to Voidex talk from last year, so it was recorded, um, you can um, follow it there. Then another one, um, I just already mentioned um, the um, fairly prevalent sensitivity around privacy. Um, Europe is actually really spearheading and has, um, with its enacted laws, um, set new boundaries for how um, customer data has to be protected and um, what you as the customer um, have in terms of rights when the data ends up in, in someone's cloud. And so the, the reaction to that is that instead of thinking of, um, for example, the Microsoft Cloud as just one homogeneous carpet of data centers around the globe, um, that would actually be the ideal solution from any other points of view, but it's not ideal from a political point of view. Um, we actually go and have our data centers grouped into regions, and the regions are grouped into what we call geos, um, effectively geographic and geopolitical areas. Um, and some of, the, of those um, geo regions are um, tagged as being national. And so right now, the two in production are um, in China and in Germany, but there are a few more in the pipeline. Um, largely related to how large is the market um, and um, that market's ability to actually put, put such a, a dedicated infrastructure to the use. Um, and then there's a the concept of private clouds. There's a whole bunch of industries where at least today the idea of moving your work into someone else's data centers isn't quite acceptable, um, but for many other reasons you would actually like to. Um, and so the notion of private cloud is saying, in the case of Azure, it's called Azure Stack. Um, Microsoft is giving you um, pre-certified hardware coming from another company like HP um, with a large part of the Azure software stack um, precast into that hardware and managed um, effectively on your behalf by Microsoft, but the entire thing sits in your own data center and it's entirely up to you whether you, for example, want to cut the network connections or whatever else you might want to do um, if you want to lock it down. Um, so you get this whole spectrum of clouds um, and it's, it's often confusing because we, when we start hearing about um, issues with cloud services, people don't differentiate these things. Right? They don't, for example, say, okay, if I'm running in one of those national clouds, for example, the one in Germany is run by T-Systems, 
um, the, the Deutsche Telekom Lager, um, and not by Microsoft. Right? So T-System runs for us on behalf of Microsoft, and everything that goes into these clouds stays in them, um, stays in this case within um, the German kind of territory. Which many people in Europe find more comforting than having it, for example, in the United States. All right, so you can see a um, whole bunch of constraints. Here's another one um, close to my heart. If you bank your own business on a cloud service, then you want that cloud service to be perfectly reliable right? in an ideal world. It's a little bit like the old telephony system where you expected the dial tone would just always be there. Like, and turns out the old telephone system used to be much better than the new mobile phone systems. Right? The old telephone system would give you a dial tone even if the power was completely out in the area. Because they have their own power backup systems that last for weeks and um, stuff like that. Um, so out of this reliability thinking comes this world of nines. Right? So how many, how many nines, 0 0.9, 0 0.99 and so on, um, percentage, point, 90%, 99% and so on, um, of uptime um, do you want to guarantee? Right. So of course 100% would be nice, um, but if you look at this table here, um, if you want to guarantee four nines measured over a month, then only about 260 seconds of downtime are allowed in the entire month. Right? It quickly collapses. Um, five nines, it's 25 seconds. Okay, so if you are down for half a minute in an entire month once, you have already missed um, your um, SLA. Um, so the reality is that today, um, the um, Azure services typically offer um, three nines, and um, that often isn't enough. So the suggestion then is if you want higher availability, then the recommendation is that you go into two different Azure regions, which guarantees separate, physically separate data centers, um, and you build a solution that either in an active-active or in an active-passive pattern um, runs over these two different regions. And it really depends on what your primary driver is. Do you want to go after business continuity? Which really means, hey, if a meteorite hits a data center, um, you know, that's actually not the most likely scenario, but it's a very picturesque one. So meteorite hits data center, data center is permanently gone. Then as a customer, you would want to know how much of my data is, is now still recoverable. Right? So if you, for example, do a copy behind of all data activities to another region, then you would lose only the last seconds or minutes of newly arriving data and everything else is still recoverable. And the other question you would have is, how long does it take me to get back into an operational state in that other region? Right, and so to, to, um, out of that consideration, in Azure, for example, all regions, each region has multiple data centers, but all regions come as pairs. So, and these pairs are intentionally spread far apart. They do stay in the same um, geo um, to make sure that um, geopolitical constraints are violated. And then these pairs are the recommended um, sort of high availability pairs that you should use to build on top of. And the idea there is that um, within Microsoft in this case, um, we take um, sort of extra precaution to never do anything that might affect two regions in such a pair at the same time. Okay, so that's, that's the foundation for high availability and business continuity. And it is, it's actually amazing if you think about millions of machines constantly running, um, stuff absolutely happens. Um, everything happens, right? Everything from um, CPUs to storage devices to memory failing to networks getting separated. Everything you can imagine happens, and it happens quite often. So these things are very real. Um, if, you, if you work with a computer sitting under your desk, if you're like me, you, you rarely have catastrophic events. Right? Like these things tend to run for years, and it usually to the point where you lose data when they, when they finally have a problem. Um, but they usually are very reliable. But if you go times millions of them, then you see every possible thing, and you'd see it all the time. So this is actually a directly relevant thing in our daily operations. All right, so coming back to if you, we did kind of a rainbow walk through all these, these constraining 
um, requirement areas. Right? And you could actually go as a customer, you could rightfully say, hey, you know, at the absolute minimum price, I want maximum in each of those constraint spaces, right? So I want maximum security, um, I want perfect estimation, um, I want total predictability, I want fully deterministic results. Um, so you can keep going like that, and you'll find that, the, that, that this um, resulting problem is so over-constrained that it can't be done. Um, or that the minimum price you were hoping for is actually astronomical, because someone is actually putting data centers on your specific behalf around the globe, just for you. So, that's already hard. Um, it gets even more interesting if you go, remember we talked about platform services as a main focus for today. If you're not going and saying what I would like to do is, is compose more interesting solutions out of um, what the platform services can do individually. Right? Then you actually need to worry about all these dimensions, but at the level of your own solution. So you, the architect of a solution, need to actually understand enough about all of that to actually say, well, the way I compose my system will not violate, for example, my, my overall security requirements. And it is surprisingly easy to violate these things. Right? So for example, in Azure, as a customer, you're not stopped from building a solution that crosses um, geopolitical regions. If that's what you want to do, we totally support it. If you did that without intending it, you may find that your data leaves the territory where it's supposed to be locked. Right? And so you're now in violation of some law, and the only, the only person, if you like, um, responsible is, is the person who puts that solution together. Right? Um, Microsoft can go and put extra alerts in your way and say, look, we sent you a warning that you're crossing um, geo regions and things like that. But fundamentally, we're not going to disallow that because most internationally operating companies do have solutions that correctly and appropriately span the globe. Um, but you need to really understand which other data artifacts can cross those lines and which should not. So, um, quite a challenge. Um, it gets even more interesting if you want to go and build an openly composed solution. And so what is that? Imagine um, you want to be SAP and you would like to be building an SAP-like system on top of a cloud. Right? Now SAP may go and build their own cloud, but um, let's say a little smaller than SAP. So you want to build something like SAP, but you want to build it on top of um, one of those public cloud systems. Um, but you want to establish your own ecosystem. Right? As you know, the SAP systems have a huge army of smaller companies that provide extensions into the SAP systems. And there's another army of companies that know how to configure SAP systems and their extensions into actual solutions. But if you wanted to build that, then you need to leave certain openings in the solution you have built. Right? And unless you want to completely build your own world of abstractions, you probably do this by saying, well, the following extensibility point works, by the customer spinning up, let's say, a new VM that implements the following protocols. And um, some configuration pointing the system that you built to those VMs. Right. Um, so you're effectively opening up your solution to let some of the underlying platform shine right through. And at that point, you know, things get really hairy. And I, I, I stop having any kind of like even guidance. So the spectrum that we talked about is, is really this one here, where you go all the way from, I'm building solutions for my own organizations, or maybe I hire someone, a solution integrator, um, to actually do this for me, to the next step, where I'm an independent solution vendor. By the way, we used to call these things independent software vendor, right? ISV. Um, so an independent solution vendor is someone who builds solutions on one or more of these public cloud systems and resells them. Right? And if you resell things, you have to readdress some of the original problems that we talked about. Like for example, tenancy. What does it mean if you sell your solution? Let's say you build a game, right? And you want to sell that game, and it's a multiplayer game. Are those players playing in separated worlds? Or are they all playing in the same big world? You have to answer these questions for your own solution, right? And you need to know how to map that down. 
You need to create your own billing model. You need to understand how billing works. Turns out billing um, in the service world is one of the harder things. Um, it's one of the things that surprised me quite a bit when I first started looking at it. You think, how hard can it be? Um, it's amazingly hard to accurately sum up the right kind of bill. We never want to overbill customers. We really don't like that. Um, constantly underbilling them, you won't like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, and almost completely ignored, by the way, um, as far as I can tell, in the world of um, academic research. How to actually build solutions for which you know how to build um, so that you actually can ultimately pay your own bills, right? <laughs> And then the last one is independent platform vendor. I mentioned that if you want it to be um, like SAP running on top of public cloud systems, then you're exactly in that space. Right? And um, things get very, very transitive at that point. So at this point, when I talk about all these things, people usually ask me, so Clemens, why can't I just do all this in Python? Right? Or pick something else, Scala. Go, whatever, whatever you like, um, right? Because you know, universal general purpose programming languages, that's, that should be all you need to string together these solutions. Um, they clearly can issue REST requests and do whatever you want. Um, and you know, part of the problem is you can do whatever you want. That's part of the problem, um, not part of the solution. Because you'll not be able to, unless you write a tiny amount of such script code, you'll not actually be able to, to really say what the behavior of that composed system is um, that you're kind of composing with a huge um, mass of code. So here's the thing that I like to use to talk about um, languages. Um, one way to look at them is, are they specific to a machine? And machine doesn't have to be Intel hardware. A um, machine can be anything, right? It could be a pattern recognizer as a machine. And then you can have a language that is very specific to pattern recognition. Um, or is it specific to a domain? Right? A domain, in this case, may be face recognition. You know, pattern recognizer, face recognition are close, but um, maybe not the same. Um, and in general, if you go for, for the universal space, you have a Turing machine on the one side, and you have the world of all possible problem domains on the other side. Right? And general purpose languages have traditionally aimed to sort of like be the um, one, and, um, one and all kind of thing for everybody. And we still create more of those all the time. Right? So, so there's, there's some magic attraction to these languages. Uh, one way I like to sort of like refine this a little bit is to point out um, what the complexity of these languages is. And not complexity in terms of how many primitives do they have or, or junk like that. But in terms of, if I want to analyze anything written in these languages for specific properties that I care about, right, I very quickly fall off a cliff. These languages very quickly take me into really kind of like computer science level complexity where analysis very quickly explodes. Um, and so then you go and say, okay, great. Um, I would like to have languages that are a little less powerful, a little more specific, either closer to machines or closer to domains. Um, and in return, I hopefully have less complexity and more chance of analysis. Um, and, and so that's, that's exactly what's happening. And just as we produce thousands of general purpose languages, there are of course also thousands of not so general um, purpose languages. There may be even more than um, general purpose ones. And I'm just going to show you two examples um, today. Um, the, the, real, the really interesting thing here is that I'm seeing a trend of inverting what in the last 10 years has happened. So in the last 10 years, um, starting maybe with the Link project um, that was part of um, C Sharp, um, you know, there was this idea of saying, let's have a declarative, actually more functional monadic language embedded inside the general purpose language C Sharp. Right? And there's now a similar thing for Java and for other languages. Um, the interesting thing is if you have the general purpose monster on the outside, the embedded special purpose thing may be convenient, but from, the, from an analysis point of view, you're already lost. 
The general purpose thing on the outside will mess up all analysis. Unless you're super lucky, um, you'll not be able to determine whether or not there's any state entanglement happening between your functional expressions and your general purpose expressions and so on. So what I'm increasingly seeing is kind of a resurgence of declarative and sometimes functional, but often declarative languages um, that live on the outside and that basically control a space in a way that is analyzable, where you have little islands of arbitrary kind of Turing code, if you like, embedded. So you would actually say, hey, we already knew that, that's what we thought was the right answer in the 80s or something. Um, so it keeps going back and forth. But I'll, I'll show you two examples of, of such um, domain-specific things um, that sit on top. So here, here's a number of examples um, of things that I've actually worked on or worked with. Um, over the past many years, and I'm going to show you the first and the last one on this slide. Um, Azure Resource Manager um, is an abstraction for um, all um, services in the Azure Cloud. And um, because it's a uniform abstraction, um, there's a concept of resource creation, for example, or resource binding that is universal. So at that level, you can write templates, declarative scripts that compose instances of platform services. Um, another one, Power Query, is a thing that, that I actually very directly worked on um, that is now um, a built-in part of Excel and has replaced many of the older kind of um, get data and data manipulation tools in Excel. Um, it's a little functional language um, that, that has um, just the right amount of functional capabilities um, that allows you to solve many of your problems, but it is also um, simple enough that we can dynamically analyze what those expressions do in the context of the actual data you're connecting to. So that's why it's a dynamic uh, analysis, and it's used in, in multiple forms to, to simplify your life and give you some assurance of what's going on. Um, then stream analytics I talked about um, in the very beginning um, is a near real-time stream processing service um, that I had been working on for the past two something years. And um, in stream analytics, we have a declarative job level and an embedded functional um, data flow level. Um, and that's where today ends, although we're thinking about embedding um, the next smaller, um, truly kind of arbitrary code islands. Um, and here we use static analysis to guarantee repeatable at least once um, semantics. Um, and again, we would not know how to do that if, if it were just a Python script or a C-sharp program or anything like that. And the last thing, and this also one where, where I'm going to drill in a little more, um, time permitting, I need to hurry up a little, um, is uSQL, Unified SQL, um, interesting language merger uh, between traditional SQL and um, a programming language, in this case, C-sharp. So let's just go there. So I already said I'm going to talk about these two guys a little more. Um, interesting is what you get from the analyses that we run um, over the outer declarative form in, in those um, two examples. So for Azure Resource Management, it's actually relatively simple what it does. Um, but it solves a big problem, which is deterministic deployment of mutually dependent um, systems. Um, you don't, you really don't want to do this by running um, scripts, for example, that wait on conditions and stuff. And the other one does far more. Um, does cost optimization, um, leads to predictable execution, um, puts bounds on performance, um, establishes firm security parameters, all of that simply by having an, an, a fully analyzable outer shell um, of, your, um, of the description of what you want to do. So let's go a little fast through this one here. This is like um, lots of details. Um, let's just go through that without talking about it. The, so the interesting thing is with these templates, what you just saw, by the way, let's just look at one of those guys. So what these things here all give you are conventions for using JSON um, as, as a language. So this is an example of a DSL where there isn't even syntax. Right? 
20 years ago, we would have used XML. Now we use JSON, whatever. Uh, but the important thing is this is a language that is effectively a data structure. Um, there is no syntax. Right? And um, that only works because it's simple enough. If you take this too far, it becomes very unmanageable. So the example that you just saw here fly by um, with me spending no time on is um, allowing you to build a simple website by starting at the bottom of deploying a farm of servers, a farm of VMs. Um, then when that has completed, creating um, the actual website and um, establishing some configuration on top of it, like for example, auto scaling of the server farm. Um, once that has completed, attaching the website to both a telemetry system that's called App Insights, um, establishing a set of alert rules, to, for example, say, hey, this file auto scale, the system is overloaded, for example, or something has failed. Um, and then deploy the actual website um, itself into the system. And so when all that has completed, um, then the um, ARM template execution completes. And you may have seen in the last little bit of JSON that I had fly by you there, um, the template itself says what kind of output it wants to produce. And since the execution here only leads to a now running system, it doesn't have anything to do with the output of the system itself. The output here um, will give you log data um, around how long certain things took or what IP addresses were allocated for your website and things like that. So this is an example where traditionally um, people would have written um, scripts and hopefully used a very conventional style for those scripts to at least believe they know um, what's going on. Right. Well, here you have um, a little graph analyzer making sure that the deployment stages are actually not in a cyclical dependency. That's very simple to do, of course, if you have this declarative order um, level. Um, it is quite clear what the staging has to be, um, and you'll not get into a situation where the system um, claims to be successfully deployed, but you have some parts in the middle of it missing. Um, a very common problem, by the way, with the deployment, if you're not careful. The second example um, I want to spend a little bit of time on is this uh, language that we um, released, I think, about a year ago in public preview, um, close to um, general availability now. Um, what we did is we took the language T-SQL, which is Microsoft's variant of ANSI SQL, and um, used that SQL language as our outer language. We only use the data definition, data query language parts of it. Um, and then we post arbitrary C-sharp expressions that can ultimately call into arbitrary user code um, inside that language. Right, so that is a strange hybrid um, and it takes a little bit of getting used to, um, but it's incredibly powerful because that declarative outer level allows us to do things like analyze the entire data flow graph for parallelizability, look at the actual input data sets in terms of uh, metadata and statistics, and then build a plan for fully parallelized execution at scale. Um, this language actually is a derivative from um, a language called Scope that has been used within Microsoft for about 10 years now. Um, <coughs> Scope, and you may have heard of another thing called Cosmos. Um, Cosmos is the underlying system um, that Scope runs on top of. Um, it is it's a kind of a mega scale system that runs on hundreds of thousands of machines. Um, and runs a large part of the Microsoft business. Um, for example, it runs Bing um, with its search indexer. And um, the, or if you run ad campaigns on Bing and you say, I want to bet, uh, I want to bid on particular keywords, then um, within 10 something minutes, um, the system will tell you how successful your campaign was so that you can fine tune your keyword bids. Um, that's the thing that runs um, on top of Cosmos. Um, knows its implementation really, knows how to leverage thousands of machines for a single task, if you like. That is, that is actually um, fairly enormous. For example, if you look at Hadoop clusters, an entire Hadoop cluster tops out in the thousands of machines. Right? The largest anywhere is like 9,000 machines. Cosmos clusters are like 50,000 machines and individual jobs run on thousands of machines, if that's useful. 
For example, I have a little demo, I can't show it to you right now here, a little demo where um, we have a single file that um, touches like petabyte size, one file, abstraction at least, um, that has all URL strings ever seen by Bing, okay, when crawling the web. And um, you can interactively query over that. Basically, you just type some patterns in and it just gives you a result within um, tens of seconds. Um, so this system, um, we took and said, okay, we wanna make that a product. And we took the language, cleaned it up, it's called USQL. Um, took the underlying system, Cosmos, cleaned it up, it's called Azure Data Lake um, Storage and Azure Data Lake Platform. Um, and so that system is, is pretty one of the newest things added to um, Azure. So let's, let's um, have a quick look at how this looks. So I already mentioned um, the kind of like injection of C Sharp. Um, and this could just as well be um, Java or Python um, for, for obvious reasons. We started with C Sharp here. Um, but so you can have C Sharp expressions directly in select statements. So you can have the full world of arbitrary C Sharp expressions um, in what looks like a SQL select. Um, and then we have user-defined functions, user-defined aggregates, and user-defined operators as extensibility points. And I'll show you a little more about these things. So if you look at operators, for example, um, you get extensibility at the entire kind of life cycle, if you like, of a data flow or data production graph. Um, extractors and outputters are kind of the input and output side of things. Um, processors are row by row transformations. Um, appliers um, basically take one row and produce zero to n rows output. Um, combiners kind of do the opposite. Um, and our reducers do the opposite, and combiners um, are a join like construct where you have multiple row sets and you um, combine them. So, you would say, why, why are, do we have so many different um, user defined things here? Right? We talk about user defined functions, there's also user defined types, which I haven't mentioned, um, user defined operators exploding into these six different categories. Um, in the end, it's all just general purpose code that's running, so it can do whatever it wants. The important thing is by categorizing your custom code into these top-level abstractions, um, you basically promise to the analyzer um, that you're going to obey by the contract. And that means the analyzer, as long as you're not messing up, if you do mess up, you're only messing up your own job, not some other customer's jobs. But um, as long as you don't mess up, you effectively get all the power of the um, optimization strategies, um, even with all your custom code in the middle, including scale optimization. So all this is assembled into a big uh, metadata catalog um, that effectively knows what the definitions are of all your extensions and um, also traditional definitions like um, tables and views and table body functions and so on. Um, so here's an example of um, a USQL script. And we did something that you could argue is perhaps a little bit hacky. Um, in SQL itself, the casing of keywords is not significant. Um, but because we wanted the smooth integration of C-sharp expressions inside SQL, we insist that um, you write SQL um, keywords in all uppercase. Um, and C-sharp has all its keywords in all lowercase naturally. Um, so this is a valid interpretation of SQL, but a constraining one. Um, so if you're used to writing your SQL in all lowercase, then too bad, you need to change that. Um, but the, the important point here is that um, with this simple kind of like syntactic convention, um, without any further bracketing and whatever, um, you get a smooth embedding of um, one expression mode inside the other language. So you see here is a traditional um, SQL select including aggregates, um, left out of join, where clause group by. Um, then by saying you can bind variables and build a graph over that, you're effectively building a data flow graph. And it's still totally visible to the system. And um, that's actually the, a very important part. So your overall script <coughs> with the combination of SQL and C sharp ultimately forms a logical execution graph that the compiler and optimizer um, can fully transform to something that runs at massive scale. 
Um, there's support for unstructured and structured data. So for unstructured data, just like sets of files, um, the system will schematize on read. It will basically observe what the schema is dynamically and adjust to that. Um, for um, structured data, you have a more traditional world of um, schema information being stored separately in a metadata. <coughs> So here's an example where you're reading, and in you know, and in practice, you wouldn't go and literally say my input is this one file. It's much more likely that you say my input is all the files captured by this pattern, and um, you have your data spread across a huge collection of such files, maybe millions of them. All right, so then. On the inner expression level, um, the type system is that of C-sharp. Um, expression language is C-sharp. And if you have user-defined functions, you basically say, I'm referencing a blob of arbitrary code. Yes, the code has to start with the .NET code, but um, we have um, all sorts of examples where you, for example, run um, a Python script on every vertex in the massively parallel system. Um, over the data that you want to transform. Right? So in that case, the c sharp rule is only kind of the entry point into your Python rule. Same thing for user-defined aggregators, um, user-defined operators, and so on. So let's, let's finish with this thing here. So what then happens is that the compiler actually goes and looks at your entire combined script, possibly living in many files, and builds um, a gigantic tree um, to, as actually, really, if you look at bindings itself, you may even have a graph. Um, what we see here is a DAG. Um, so that is, is a full description of what you want to do. Um, we do something fairly unusual. The compiler actually executes in the context of your specific and current input data. Okay, so the compiler runs every time you run um, a job. Instead of saying compile once and then run repeatedly, the compiler runs every time. The optimizer also runs every time. And that means um, we can do things like, for example, eliminate empty partitions. So if your data is partitioned and some partitions just don't have anything in them, in this run, then we don't spin up any, uh, any resources to process over such empty data sets. The other thing the compiler does is it looks at this big graph and decides which islands of computation are meaningfully executable as pipelined steps. So it basically tells the compiler, this is the maximal pipelineable clustering of my graph. Um, if you actually executed it like that, you would massively over-allocate machines. Um, so the optimizer actually now goes and builds the actual physical execution graph by taking these pipelineable steps and clustering them again together into actual execution stages. And the stage runs in parallel on possibly thousands of machines and is asynchronously, asynchronously decoupled from the next stage and possibly the next stage and so on. Um, and so to make that all manageable, um, we have a pretty, pretty rich um, tool set that allows you to actually get visibility into what all this stuff does. As you can actually see heat maps, for example, that tell you oh, the plan that we built will completely overload this one, um, this one vertex or this one machine, um, perhaps because your data is very skewed and we didn't know that. All right, so at this point, I'm actually a little bit over. All right. Okay, thank you very, very much for this very interesting.